We're continuing the series core, uh, living a life on mission and vision with values. I don't know about you, but I, I'm tired of living in, in a season where you just run from one crisis to the next, where it feels like the best day is the day where nothing breaks. The series is a series all based around how do we move from surviving to thriving? How, how do we move to a people that have a mission? The people that have a vision of what life could be and, and the people that have some core values that kind of act like bumpers that keep us in the middle of the road so we can fulfill that vision so we can be the people that live out that mission. So Pastor Dave started this series last week and just introducing what our mission was. And this week we're continuing and it's a series that lasts all summer long, and so I'd encourage you to be here with this summer. But at the end of his sermon, he shared what his life mission was. And it made me realize I had these two cards that are, that are hanging right next to my desk on the little post. And I, as about five years ago, I was, I was with a, a, about five or six other youth pastors, and, and one of the youth pastors was having one of those what's the point days. You guys have had those, right? What's the point? Why did I get up? Why do I go to work? Why do I try? What's the point? And we let them have the what's the point pity party for a few minutes because that's what friends do, right? And one of the youth, other youth pastors, they, they, they pulled out index cards and they gave everybody two. And he said, I totally hear. We all have what's the point days. But here's what you need to do on the what the point days are. You need to remember what your mission is. And so he gave us one, one to write what our mission for ministry was and one to write what our personal mission was. So I, I thought as I started this series, I, I, I would share what mine were. So I wrote these five years ago, not knowing we were doing this series. I wrote, my mission is to help individuals seek a new and deeper relationship with God that causes their lives to be different. And on the second card I wrote, my mission is to be the father and the husband and friend that shares in the rhythms of life that express the love of our triune God. So when I have the what's the point days, that's the point. The point is that we all need to be deeper in our relationship with Jesus. The point is I need to be a better father and I need to be a better husband and I need to be a better friend. And the reason I need to be all those things is because God loves me and I need to love them, and they need to love me. And so there isn't a what's the point day if you have a clear mission. And as part of that mission, I, I had a major milestone for myself this last week. This last week, I was up uh, on, in Lakeside, Ohio, on Lake Erie with a, with a team of Shiloh delegates, and we were part of the annual conference. And while I was there, I, I had this awesome opportunity. They had a, a worship service and at that service, they were, they were celebrating people that were retiring. And some of you remember Dean Feldmeyer. Dean was part of the, uh, the service, and, and he retired, and they celebrated his ministry. And so afterwards, I, I went and talked with him for a few minutes, and he said, Shiloh. And when he said Shiloh, his eyes lit up, and he was standing next to his wife, and she smiled. And he said, we remember Shiloh. We love Shiloh. Can you tell them that we love them? So I'm here to say, Dean still loves you all. Later that same day, I ran into to Pastor Bill Patterson, and, and he was sharing with me that he's now retired, but he's, he's working in missions with the Reynoldsburg United Methodist Church. And, and I ran into to Pastor Rachel uh, Phillips, and, and she and Bill both said, oh, Shiloh, we, we love Shiloh. And they both shared with me that there's such pride that they had this connection to Shiloh. See, in our missional booklet that came out this year, over 900 people are part of our conference in Shiloh United Methodist Church, where we were 8th in baptisms and 18th in membership. And they thought, that's the church that we were part of. That's the church that I remember. So give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> but then on Tuesday, I, I went to a worship service and, and I, I got ordained. It's a huge step for those in, in ministry. This is, this is I, I stood before about 6,000 people, and, and they confessed that they saw what was happening in my life and God. And so 
Thank you. I was ordained into word. I was ordained into service, into compassion, and into justice. I was ordained to help connect the community with the church and the church with the community. And this has been a long journey for me. I've been on this journey somewhere between nine and ten years, and I want to say thank you all. Thank you for, for allowing me to make mistakes, and you still love me. A lot of mistakes, some of you are thinking. Thank you for, for letting me come into my own a little bit more, learning a little bit more about, about what it is that God needed to do in my life and what it is to be part of a church. At this service, uh, Pastor Daniel's son, Jeremiah, uh, Pastor Daniel, Nikki's son, he represented you all, and he carried my stole in. And that stole is a representative of what's happening here at Shiloh. And the stole is not only special because of that, but it was also because this was Pastor Den's stole that he passed down to me. And so last 930 service, I wore Pastor Den's stole that is now my stole that was given to me on behalf of Shiloh through Jeremiah. And I was, uh, the bishop laid hands on me and prayed, and I was ordained. Church, I, I tell that story because you don't show up in Cambodia on accident. You don't spend a 10-year journey getting ordained on accident. Dean Feldmeyer didn't do a 30 years of ministry and then just go, you know what, I guess I'm, I guess I'm just done. I don't know. I woke up today and thought, nah. Pastor Bill didn't get to retirement and decide to keep doing mission work on accident. First service, we celebrated someone's 40th anniversary. You don't, you're not married for 40 years just on accident. You don't just wake up and go, I guess, I guess I'll just do it again today. If you do, you're a better person than me. The great things that happen in life, they have, to, they have to happen on purpose. They have to happen with intent. And that's what this entire series is all about. It's recognizing this is where I am today. This is the mission God has for me. Here's the vision of what it would look like if that mission was happening. And I need a set of core values that make sure that I don't go out of bounds or lose my way. Because some of our missions our 10, 15 lifelong missions. Some of them are short-term, but if, the longer they are, the more core values and the harder those have to be in place. That's what this series is all about. So as we jump in to today, can we, just, can we just take a moment to pray? Lord, we, uh, we come to you. We come to you with people that uh, believe that we have a mission. We come to you seeking a vision we come to you helping and asking that you help put values in our life, that, that we can become the church and the people that you need us to be on this corner, in this city, in the state, in the United States, and around the world. Lord, we don't come asking as if you haven't been working in us already. We come saying, Lord, uh, we know that you've been very busy, and we want to join in on what you've been doing. We want to stand on the shoulders of those who have gone on before us, and we want to be the movement that allows others to stand on our shoulders so your kingdom can be present here on earth. And all God's people said, amen. Now, who hasn't had one of those what's-the-point days, like my youth pastor friend? You've had those, right? Help me, because if not, I feel like a loser. The only person that has those. Nod your heads. You've, you've had those, right? right? There we go. Thank you. I need to know I'm not alone. <laughs> We've all had them. What's the point? Who am I really? What am I going to do? What am I going to be? I've got a secret for you. You will never, ever be able to answer that question if you don't know your maker. If you don't know who God is, how could you possibly know who you are? If you don't know the person that breathed the very breath into your lungs, how could you possibly know who you are? If you don't know the person that knit you together in your womb, how could you ever start to grasp who it is that you are supposed to be? See, I, I think in the world, they, they've been filling with it. This is how you know yourself, and this is how, and it's all about your accomplishments, and, and it's all about these, these things. But the reality is you can never know who you're supposed to be, who you're called to be, what you're called to do and be, if you don't know your maker. 
And so when we started this core series, that's exactly why we started with the, with the word worship. Because that's what worship is. It, it's, it's all about knowing God. For being honest, I, I hope that many of us showed up here today seeking God. I hope most of us showed up today saying, God, I, please, please just reveal yourself to me because I need you. And God, I hope we get to celebrate what you're doing in and around the world. And I hope I have something to celebrate by the end of this service. I hope that's the reason you came here because that's why we worship. That's how, that's how this happens. And we do this with our head. That's the reason you, you hear scripture readings. And that's the reason I'm using the word to share with, with who God is. We do it with our hearts. That's the reason our band led us in music and, and we have times of prayer. And we do it with our hands. That's the reason we, we take communion. It's tangible. We hold the very body of Jesus and we dip it in the blood of Jesus and we take it. It's the reason we have baptism where we feel the water rush over us and we're born anew. It's also why so often we're called to respond to worship, to go out into the world to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Because when we worship, in order to know God better, we need to do it with our head, our heart, and our hands. And this is what the church does for us. It's what the church is supposed to do. It helps us to, to truly know who made us, to truly know who God is. And we do this through a rhythm. We do this through a rhythm of gathering and dispersing. Gathering and dispersing. Right? We gather on Sunday mornings, but we don't live here. This isn't, this isn't our home. We disperse out into the world. We gather and we disperse because, remember, the people are the church. You guys remember the steeple, and we are the people. If you don't know, your neighbor explain that after the service. It'll be good. But people, steeple. We are the people. And so the church, you are just as much the church when we gather as when you are dispersed. We gather and we disperse. We gather and we disperse. The problem is when that, when that rhythm gets a little off, we have trouble thriving and we go into surviving. Let me, let me give you an example of what I mean. Uh, the same rhythm is the rhythm in which we breathe, right? We breathe in, do this, breathe in, and breathe out. We breathe in and we breathe out. We breathe in, we gather, and we disperse. We breathe in, all the air molecules gather, and we breathe out, they disperse. We breathe in, oxygen gathers, we breathe out, carbon dioxide disperses. We breathe in, oxygen gathers, which we need, we breathe out, carbon dioxide goes out, which the world needs. We breathe in, we breathe out. We gather, we disperse. But if we treated our worship life and our breathing life the same, here's actually the rhythm it would be. I want you to try this. We breathe in on Sunday, and we breathe out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We breathe in on Sunday, <gasps> Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Life happens. We can't breathe out on there, or can't breathe in this Sunday. We breathe in <gasps> Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And we start hyperventilating. And our lives move from survive or from thrive to survive. So if the only time we're ever they're going to worship is when we're gathered, no shocker that in our faith that we spend more time in survival than in thriving. So this morning I want to talk about what does it mean? How can we worship is the people that gather, but how can we also worship is the people dispersed? So we can have that breathe in, breathe out type of understanding of worship. I believe if we're going to have this kind of worship, we need to, to have a life story of worship. So if we're going to have a life story of worship, how is it that we go about doing this as the dispersed people? As the gathered people, we know how to do this. We come and we get coffee and we sit in worship and we sing songs and we hear words and we seek after God. We hope he's revealed to us and we celebrate what God's doing. But then we disperse. So how as dispersed people can we be a people of worship? Well, I think that we can find out exactly how to do that through scripture. 
There's a guy named Paul who writes a good portion of the New Testament, and, and he knew what we're about to read already, and, and we'll hear some, some readings from him in a little bit because these are the things that he knew, and so he encouraged the early church to do these things as well. See, in Acts 2, the disciples and the apostles, I imagine they felt like dispersed people. Jesus has already ascended into heaven, and there they are, left as the dispersed, with a mission to share the good news in this city, in this state, and around the world. They were people dispersed, and here's what it says they did. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. As you read this scripture, I'm not advocating that we sell all of our stuff and move in together. I don't think we're there. And two, you don't want to live with me. Ask my wife. She's stuck. However, I am advocating. Did you see the word every day? Every day they continued to meet. Every day they ate together in their homes. Every day they praised God. See, as dispersed people, they found ways to worship. And this isn't uncommon in other practices. If you're a runner, the first time you try to go out and run, it's all about surviving the three miles or mile or whatever it is, right? You get to the end, you go, <gasps> speaking of hyperventilating, thank God I made it. But if you consistently run, it shifts from surviving to thriving. All of a sudden, you hear these people that run, and, and they go, I only ran, you know, seven miles today. And you're like, what? I ran two and about passed out. But because they consistently do it, it's just, so they start working on their time, and they start working on their distance. It becomes what happens. If our band decided they were just going to play music one day a week, they would probably just be surviving the song. And if we're being honest, no offense, but we would have to survive through it as well. But they, they don't just do it one day a week. They practice. They prepare. They do their best to do it consistently. Now, I know that we can't meet together in the temple, as Scripture says. We can't come to church every single day. But this doesn't mean that we can't worship every day. It doesn't mean that we can't have a life story of worship. So if you have a mission and a vision that is anything centered around loving Jesus or being a disciple of Jesus Christ, which, side note, I believe most of you, that's your driving force for being here. And if that's not your driving force for being here, somebody you're with, it's their driving force, and you're here to watch them do that. Or they've encouraged you to come and see what it is they're doing. If your mission and vision includes being a disciple of Jesus Christ, then I believe one of the core values that's absolutely necessary is to have a life story of worship. It's not something you do, but, but it's something that's just part of your story. So if we're going to have a life story of worship, I believe it's, it's just really three simple steps. It's the same steps we talked about doing here. We seek God. We reveal God. We celebrate God. And I'm not brilliant. I didn't make this up. I found it right out of Scripture in the words of Paul. See, here's something Paul knew. He knew what the disciples and the apostles did in the book of Acts, and they met together, okay? He also knew this, this passage, Mark chapter 1, 15. He knew the very words of Jesus, and Jesus said, the time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus says, when, when God is near, repent and believe. Repent and believe. Do you feel the rhythms that God has going on in your life? God comes near, you repent, and you believe. So on Sunday mornings, that's exactly what we do, right? We come and, and we ask God to, to, be, 
to be present. We seek after him. We ask for him to reveal, and we celebrate what he's doing through, through music and prayers and scriptures. And so as, as a life story of worship, we should be seeking God in the everyday, not just in the day, the calendar of life. So I don't mean in the everyday, but I mean in the everyday. Here's what I mean. You know, I can put something on my calendar every day, so I do it once a day. Or I can find something in the every day, which happens multiple times a day. Do you guys see the difference? So I'm talking about worshiping not just every day, not just on, you know, 7 a.m. When, when my alarm goes off. I'm talking about actually worshiping God in the everyday pieces of life. Let me, let me tell you how this goes. It's more than paying attention. It's actually seeking God. Your alarm goes off. Now, some of you may wake up like, oh, good morning, cheerio. <laughs> and if you're that person, I don't want to live with you. <laughs> Many of us, the alarm goes off and it's like, ah. But if we're living in the everyday, we go, God, I repent. I, I don't want to get up. I'm tired. But I believe that today is a very gift from you. And you had a purpose for me to wake up today. And so today, I believe that there's a reason you have me going out into the world. So today, you have drawn near. You have given me the gift of today. Therefore, I will go and do what it is you call me to do with my hands and feet. It's an act of worship. Then you get to breakfast, and you find out that, you know, that person ate your cereal. I would eat your cereal. You don't want to live with me. But you recognize that God created an earth which produces food, and he created people which prepared food, and he gave you means in which to have more than one box of cereal. And you go, God, you have provided for me in such great ways. I repent for my selfishness, and I believe that whatever food will nourish my body so I can go and do what it is you will for me to do today. And then you go to work, and you you have the days where you love work and you have the days you get paid to go to work. And on those days, you go, God, thank you for giving me purpose. Thank you for giving me people to work with and to work through. Thank you for allowing me to be your hands and feet in this environment with whatever and however and whoever I work with. And then God gives you this amazing opportunity to worship on the drive home, that guy cuts you off. And you'll need to repent. <laughs> oh, maybe that's just me. And you go, God, I'm sorry. For a minute, I really thought I was the center of the world. But I recognize I'm not, and that your world's greater than me. And that individual is in a big hurry. Lord, be with them. Help me forgive them. And Lord, help me to be forgiven when I'm that guy. And then we go home and we have dinner and we look around the table and we go, hey, God, I've taken these people for granted. You brought them into my life. I'm sorry, God. I see you, God, and each and every one of them. God, I hope that they get to see you and me. And then we go and we do whatever it is we do for fun in the evenings. And a lot of times that's the furthest thing from God. We think it is anyways. But, but what if that thing became, God, thank you for bringing me joy. Thank you for allowing me to have a space just to be happy. Yesterday, I got, to, I got to do that as I went to an FCC game. I just It's soccer. It's fun. It's a great crowd. I got to be with a good friend. And just thank you, Lord. And then we lay down and we go, God, I know I stayed up too late and I wake up too early. But God, thank you for making rest and being still part of, part of me. See, all those things can just happen, but what if we seek God in the everyday? But here's the trick. It's not only just about seeking God, it's about revealing God when we find him. Because see, God doesn't reveal himself so we can put him as a treasure and hide him in our pocket for ourselves. No, we read in scripture that you don't put a basket over a light, right? You put the light on top of the lampstand. And so as we, as we spend everyday people seeking after God, and when God reveals himself, that we share that with others. Because see, our words and our actions, that's what tells our story. That's how the world is revealed, 
from what we are. And I know this because I sit at funerals in front of the sanctuary or gravesides or at funeral homes. You know what we do with those? We tell stories. We tell the people's story. That's what we do. We tell God's story. We tell their story. And it's not what they intended to do. That's not the stories we tell. We tell the stories of what their words were and what their actions were. And we commemorate their life because it's their story. It's their actions and their words that speak to hopefully what it is they believe. So what is your story? Is your story that money was really important, so I work 60 to 70 hours a week? It's your story that I have this beautiful castle, I mean home with a white picket fence and a great 401k that I can just be comfortable the rest of my life? Is that your story? Is your story that I loved being comfortable and safe so I just stayed with a whole bunch of people that looked just like me and acted just like me and voted just like me? I don't know what your story is, but that's not the story that reveals God. None of those things are evil, by the way. I want you to hear this. Your story could absolutely be that money is part of what you do. But you know why you do it? To provide for your family and to provide for the mission of God through the church and other nonprofits. And that's the story that reveals God. The story that reveals God is that you have a beautiful home and you recognize this is the place where I can provide a life group and a small group. This is a place where I can become the missional center of my community. That when my neighbor needs a cup of sugar, they come here. When my neighbor needs someone to talk to, they come here. When my neighbor needs respite, I'm the place. You know, it's funny because this, this wasn't planned and this didn't happen first service, but I, I was talking to one of the band members, Kip. Let's welcome Kip up here real quick. Everyone give him a round of applause. Whoa, good? Yes. So I just met Kip like five minutes ago, and I'm going to hand him a mic. Never supposed to do that. Pastor Dave's not here, so it's cool. Um, but Kip was just, we were just in conversation, and he was telling me that that's exactly how he views his house. Will you tell us a little bit of just about how you and your wife, how your house is, is that kind of place? So we live in Oxford, Ohio, and uh, we just, we've only been there about 15 months. And we are struggling to find a church home up there, and that's a whole nother sermon. But what we decided was that we were going to open our house up to the students, not only for ministry, and when I say ministry, I mean kind of like guidance counseling. A lot of times they have questions about adult things that maybe they're not ready for. But we open up our house once a week for a meal that we open up to the students. They come by and get spaghetti or whatever they want to do. Um, we have uh, worship nights at our house where we will bring in local bands sometimes or I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, Carrollton, uh, Justin Mosteller, okay, they are, he's a good friend of mine and they will play at our house. Um, some of the local churches come and set up and play and once a year we have what we call a God party and it is a catered event. We have bounce houses for the kids, hay rides. We bring in music, it's, and it's totally free for everybody as a way to give back to those who built into us throughout the year. So my wife and I feel like it's not our house, it's God house. God's house, we're just kind of the caretakers of it. And so we believe that the church is not only the building, but the church is the people. Mm -hmm. And we want to be the church. So when I leave here on Sunday and the guy cuts me off and I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not the, <laughs> I have to, <sighs> that's not the church. So I have to, my wife and I want to be the church. And we do that by just offering our home. You know, you are welcome here. You are loved here. And whatever we can provide for you, we will do that if it's within our means. And so that's how we give back to our community. Awesome. Thank you. Let's thank Kip. So we seek God. We ask for him to be revealed in us. But it doesn't stop there. The last and third piece of what it means to have a life story 
of worship is, is that we seek God, that, that we reveal God when God is present, and then we celebrate. We celebrate that God has offered us mercy even though we didn't deserve it. God has given each and every one of us grace, that it is the very love of God that sustains us day after day after day. And when, and when that happens, we celebrate it. That's exactly what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He writes, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say you're going to have a marvelous life. Just be happy with it. Because that's not true. Can I get an amen? Right? Life's not just great. But what Paul says, and what I think that we, if we're going to have a life story of worship, is that we find the good in it, that we find ways to rejoice in it. And that when we look, who, who has that friend that's just the eternal optimist? You know, they wake up and just, you know, it's raining, the flowers are getting watered, you know? I mean, maybe that's what he was talking about, but I know what he's not talking about. Who has the other friend? That it's a beautiful sunny day, and you go, well, now I'm going to get sunburnt. It's hotter now. I don't like getting sunburnt. I'm, I'm easy. But what I know is that God is not calling us to be that guy. God's calling us to rejoice always. And if we're really rejoicing always, we will find ways to continually give thanks and to pray and recognize that all this is happening in and with God. And so, church, I, I come to you and I ask you, on your mission, whatever that be, on the vision that you have for what life could be, is this a core value that would help you be what God needs you to be, what God knitted you in your mother's womb to be and do? Is this a core value that would help you stay centered and focused on the vision and mission that God has for your life? through going every day and seeking God and saying, God, I want to find you, and when I do, I'll repent and believe on when that happens, revealing God to others and celebrating what God is doing in my life. Is this a core value that you'd be willing to adopt into your own life? See, for Shiloh Church, we believe it's a value that we know will help us fulfill the mission and vision that, that Pastor Dave went over last week. He, he named that our mission, it's five simple words. Shiloh's mission is developing disciples, changing the world. And the way we plan on doing this, the vision we have for this, is that Shiloh is becoming the transforming and empowering center of our community to help people be better as we worship through love, grow in faith, serve with grace, and care from compassion. So what we've done is we said, if, every, if, if making disciples, what are the four kind of reflection questions that we could help someone who wants to be a disciple reflect on their own life, both as gathered and as dispersed people? Because we're always the church, gathered and dispersed. And, and so we ask the question, how do we worship, both publicly gathered and privately dispersed? And my, my question to you is, could your dispersed life be a life story of worship? A story where you seek God, when God's present, you reveal him to others, and we celebrate all that God's doing in our life. The next two weeks, we're going we're gonna to get deeper and deeper into what it means to, to worship as a core value. So I ask you to come back and to, to help develop your mission and your vision and the, and the core values that will keep you on path. So at the end of this summer, you don't have to have the What's the point days? What am I called to do and be kind of understanding? But no, you have a core. You have a mission and you have a vision and you have a set of plans and core values that keep you on track that you can bump up against but never go out of bounds. So this summer, join us as we continue in this core series. As we are the gathered people, we are preparing to disperse. But go and... Be the people, the dispersed people that are the church in and among the world. Go in peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.